All right. Chapter 3.5, Innovate or Die. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Friedrich Nietzsche. Chapter 3.5.1, The Rise of Predation. Whenever we study nature, we should remind ourselves that the behaviors we observe in nature are incontrovertibly winning strategies for survival. This is something to keep at the forefront of our minds when we observe that killing and fratricide are some of the most common, routine, and predictable behaviors in nature. Life appears to be well-versed in primordial economics, devoted to the task of devouring those who don't devote their time and attention to lowering their BCRA. Early forms of predation used dual-use power projection tactics, which capitalized on pressurized membranes like phagocytes Tosis, or cell eating, forming cavities in their membranes. Organi organisms figured out how to rudimentary how to use rudimentary mouth-like structures to capture resources by engulfing particulate matter. This capability is extremely useful because it's multifunctional. Mouths capture resources and impose severe physical costs on attackers. In other words, mouths influence BA and CA simultaneously, giving an organism more control over their BCRA. This explains why mouth-like structures have become such a popular power projection tactic employed by multiple different species. Reference 54. Phagocytosis illustrates yet another vital function of physical power. Not only do organisms use physical power to achieve consensus on the state of ownership and chain of custody of resources, but they also use physical power to regulate their BCRA levels. Porous membranes and mouths demonstrate how some power projection tactics can influence both sides of the BCRA equation, making them highly desirable. Other power projection tactics only affect one side of the BCRA equation. For example, if you take a pressurized membrane but remove its ability to subsume particulate matter, you get armored platin. Armored platin is useful for growing CA by imposing higher prohibitive physical costs on attackers via Newton's third law, but its capability to subsume particulate matter makes it not particularly useful on capturing resources to increase BA. Nevertheless, armor plating is still a winning power projection tactic often seen in nature because of how it helps organisms with the existential imperative of lowering their BCRA and buying themselves as much prosperity margin as possible to keep themselves secure against neighbor and life. Some other examples of important dual-use power projection tactics that emerged during the early days of predation were evolutions like Philae, hair, and fla flagella, tails. These innovations allowed life to swim around and capture resources to increase BA, while simultaneously allowing them to impose physically prohibitive costs on attackers by outrunning them or by using them as whips to break apart their neighbor's membranes. Mixing these technologies with phagocytosis pro proved to be an especially powerful combination, leading to the emergence of what we now call predators. A predator is a proactive primordial economist. economist. Predators are BCRA bargain shoppers who hunt down the best BCRA deals within their local environment. Armed with dual-use power projection technologies like whips, tails, and mouths, life's early predators mastered the art of BCRA bargain shopping by swimming around and eating resource-abundant organisms with the highest BCRA levels. As oceans gave rise to, to more of these BCRA bargain shoppers, neighborhoods became increasingly more CCCH. 
organisms which develop the most effective dual-use power projecting tactics for their neighborhood became what we call apex predators. Organisms which couldn't buy themselves enough prosperity margin to adapt to their new environment were promptly devour devoured by these apex predators, as illustrated in figure 14 below. Apex predator using phagocytosis to devour a neighboring organism with high BCRA, figure 14. Some might say predation is a negative phenomenon because of how murderous and fratricidal it appears to be. This assertion is based purely on human ideology. From a systemic perspective, predation has benefits for life. In sufficient moderation, predation acts like a filter that weeds out life's most unfit and unadaptable organisms. By passing organisms through this filter, life revectors Earth's precious limited resources away from its worst prosperity margin growers towards its best prosperity margin growers, consequently buying more prosperity margin for life as a whole. In other words, the stronger and more adaptable organisms become at surviving against predation, the more capable life itself becomes at surviving against entropy. It's all about Watts. It takes a stoic mindset to recognize and appreciate the complex emergent benefits of predation. In a universe without entropy or resource scarcity, there might not be a lot to gain by filtering out organisms that are not optimized for their environment. Alas, that is not the universe we live in. Entropy and resource scarcity are very much at play, which means there is a lot for life to gain by filtering out its unfit members and re-vectoring limited resources towards its fittest members who are most capable of surviving against entropy. Without predation, life forms might operate on something like a first come, first serve, or finders keepers basis of resource management. A lack of predation would mean that organisms automatically gain monopolies on the nutrient abundant territory they discover because they are uncontested. Regardless of how strong, resourceful, or adaptable they are, the first to arrive at a resource would automatically be allowed to have monopoly control of that resource by virtue of their being unchallenged. Without the competitive stress of predation, these organisms would have far fewer external motivators to become stronger, more resourceful, and more adaptable. In other words, without predation, there would be nothing but unimpeachable, centralized monopoly control over precious resources. Free and open market. Many business professionals have had made similar arguments that monopolies aren't good for customers. They argue that competition is holistically beneficial for consumers because it compels organizations to innovate and build better products. If we accept this argument is valid, then it stands to reason that predation is a positive phenomenon because it prevents environmental resource, resource control monopolies from forming. Predation doubles as an induced competition for resources, a way to force organisms to earn their seat at the table. The result, better products, i.e. fitter organisms more capable of survival against entropy for the consumer, life itself. Without predation, the rate of environmental change would be comparatively slow. Organisms would only have to adapt to Earth's elemental changes and the sudden onset trauma of rapid elemental changes are relatively rare. Species can live for millions of generations unaffected by asteroids, super continent breakups, landmass adjustments, ice ages, glacial events, volcanic activity, and major changes in the chemistry of the atmosphere. Without predation to keep them busy during Earth's elemental downtime, Organisms would not need to be as quick to adapt, making them far less capable of rising to the challenge of surviving entropy's next attempt to kill it. Reference 48. Predation kicks the rate of existentially threatening environmental change into high gear. Pred predation kicks the rate of existentially threatening environmental change into high gear. 
Survival no longer depends on adapting to Earth's comparatively slow environmental changes. Instead, it depends on outpacing the threat posed by other life forms. The eat or be eaten dynamic of predator prey relationships gives rise to a self reinforcing feedback loop where the continuous discovery of increasingly more effective and lethal power projection tactics, techniques, and technologies begets the need for increasingly more effective power projection tactics, techniques, and technologies. More predation leads to more CCCH environment, to a more CCCH environment with faster fall and hazard. This with faster fall and hazardous BCRA levels. In response to this, organisms must first must figure out how to make their own BCRA levels fall faster, which ends up making the environment even more CCCH. And the dynamo continues. Living prosperously becomes a task devoted to making new discoveries that will help each organism survive a rigorous natural selection process. The emergent effect of this dynamic is that life becomes faster, stronger, more adaptable, more intelligent, and better at surviving against the cold and unsympathetic cruelty of entropy. Chapter 3.5.2 We owe our lives to the ecological arms race caused by predation. And Endothermy serves as a great example of the complex emergent benefits of predation. Around 250 million years ago, life above the surface of Earth was very CCCH due to the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. Organisms couldn't afford to spend a lot of time out in the open because of harsh conditions caused by predation and entropy. This presented a challenge for organisms seeking to regulate their body temperature. Not spending a lot of time on the surface meant not being able to capture an important resource from the sun, heat. Shrew-like organisms, like the ones shown in figure 15, were able to overcome this challenge thanks to biological mutations which allowed their bodies to actively produce their own heat by metabolizing fats and sugars in their food. This power projection tactic is called endothermic body heating or warm blood. Reference 48. Figure 15, a warm-blooded organism that sparked an ecological arms race. That's an ugly fellow right there. The reader should note that when predation and entropy aren't factored into our calculus, warm blood looks like an extremely inefficient use of energy and a rather unhelpful power projection tactic. Why pay for something you can get for free? As paleontologists pay... Paleon... Ecologist Mike Benton explains, endotherms have to eat much more than cold-blooded animals just to fuel their inner temperature control. Reference 55. Metabolizing food to heat the body is not merely as energy efficient as receiving heat passively from the sun. Why would an organism volunteer to compete over sacred watts and then burn those watts just to heat themselves when they have the more energy efficient option of receiving heat passively for free? The answer is because they live in a CCCH environment filled with predators and entropy. Don't you feel it? Don't you feel that that's the environment you live in? If organisms don't learn how to warm their bodies underground where it's safe, they must go above surface during the daytime where predators eagerly wait to devour them. With warm blood, organisms can keep themselves warm and safe underground during the heat of day when their natural predators are out heating themselves. Endothermic weasels can therefore save their resource capture and activities for the night after the sun goes down, and their endothermic predators are less likely to see and devour them. Because the sun is effectively a free fuel supply of exogenously available heat, cold-blooded animals don't have to compete over sunlight like they do for food. But for cold-blooded predators whose food supply suddenly turns endothermic, these predators have an existential imperative to become endothermic too, or else they risk starvation. This phenomenon leads to what has been called an ecological arms race, where both predator and prey adopt the same adaptations and engage in a cat-and-mouse game where they try to out-evolve each other. In game theory, these are called strategic shilling points. Thus, predation creates 
a game theoretic dynamic where predator and prey adopt the same shilling points. This leads to complex emergent behavior which benefit both predator and prey as both become increasingly fitter and more adapted to their local CCCH environment. As the University of Bristol explains, in, ecological, in ecology, arms races occur when predators and prey have to compete with each other and where they may be an escalation of adaptations and where there may be and where they may be an escalations of adaptations. Maybe it's there. Reference 55. Endothermy sparked an intense ecological arms race. Shrew-like prey and their reptilian predators both developed warm blood. After many years of innovate or die predatory dynamics, these creatures both developed distinctively upright bone structures, which allowed them to move faster. They both developed better eyesight and more advanced brain circuitry. Consequently, both animal classes found themselves much more capable of survival when the next major elemental change happened on Earth. Cold-blooded, ectothermic body heating is indeed a more energy-efficient design, except when the sun stops shining and the world's free fuel supply of heat suddenly disappears. 66 million years ago, Earth's biggest, strongest, and most energy-efficient organisms learned the hard way that survival is not strictly about optimizing energy efficiency. It's also about adapting to a harsh environment. To be more specific, survival is about not freezing to death when entropy throws a 7.5-mile-wild asteroid at Earth 16 times faster than a bullet, creating such a large debris cloud that direct sunlight didn't reach the surface of Earth for years. Can the reader guess what power projection tactics are useful in that environment? Self-warming blood and the full suite of improved speed, eyesight, intelligence, and other capabilities developed during the ecological arms race between endothermic predators and prey. Deprived of the power projection tactics, techniques, and technologies enjoyed by the animals which had participated in a highly competitive ecological arms race, Many dinosaurs died in mass. The resultant food supply chain disruptions led to mass starvation and eventually mass extinction for 80% of for approximately 80% of life on Earth. Meanwhile, the smaller, faster, smarter organisms with endothermic body heating that had been locked into a highly competitive arms race found themselves much better equipped to adapt to their new environment. With 80% of their compatriots gone, these animals were free to feast on what the rest left behind. These special animals are still thriving today. We call them birds and mammals. Chapter 3.5.3 Light in a fire under life's hindquarters as an intrinsic motivator to get them to adapt faster. It is the Knowledge that I'm going to die that creates the focus that I bring to being alive. The urgency of accomplishment, the need to express love now, not later. If we live forever, why even get out of bed in the morning? Because you always have tomorrow. That's not the kind of life I want to lead. I fear living a life where I could have accomplished something and didn't. Neil deGrasse Tyson, reference 56. Innovation is a tricky thing. As Clay Christensen taught us, the best innovations often don't appear to be better than the status quo. They often have worse performance characteristics. They often look highly inefficient and wasteful, and they routinely don't satisfy an existing need. This leads to the infamous inno in innovator's dilemma, where searching for an innovative strategy is predestined to look like a poor economic decision because it means burning through resources, searching for a solution to a problem nobody recognizes yet. Reference 57. For these reasons, the life of an innovator is often characterized by condescension, mockery, and underappreciation. Nevertheless, entropy demands that all life forms innovate or die. Life must find increasingly clever power projection tactics, techniques, and technologies to grow its prosperity margin and continue to thrive. When entropy inevitably strikes again and the next major elemental change occurs, innovators often have the last laugh. The mighty dinosaurs fall and the shrews inherit the earth. 
Now that we have reminded ourselves that we owe our existence to an ecological arms race, let's revisit the topic of predation and ask ourselves how should life compel its organisms to overcome the innovator's dilemma and maximize its chances of survival against entropy? How do we motivate organisms to pursue innovative power projection tactics that are predestined to look inefficient and wasteful? How do we compel ourselves to find the best survival tactics, techniques, and technologies if we can't know what they are uh, a priori? The answer doesn't appear to be intrinsic motivation because that's not what we observe in nature. What we observe in nature is a whole bunch of organisms constantly try, trying to devour each other and then narrowly survive in extinction as a direct result of the clever power projection tactics developed to avoid being devoured. Organisms didn't develop warm blood and superior speed, eyesight, and intelligence to survive against a meteor. They did it to survive against each other. And those tactics, techniques, and technologies just happened to make them more capable of surviving a meteor. This would imply that life's approach to solving the innovator's dilemma is extrinsic motivation via predation. Let that soak in. From a systemic perspective, life effectively lights a fire under its organism's hindquarters and tells them to innovate or die. Figure out better power projection tactics to grow prosperity margin so we can survive in this universe longer or else be devoured by those who are willing to step up to the task. Like Olympians training under oxygen deprivation stress of high altitudes, life seems to have figured out how to deliberately stress itself and spur innovation using predation. This process breaks up local resource monopolies and filters out the ecologically unfit and uninnovative, revectoring precious limited resources to the organisms which are stronger, more intelligent, and more adaptable. Why would life want to do this? Because an organism that is incapable of innovating is an organism that is incapable of adapting to the environment. Organisms which can't adapt to the environment are destined to die to entropy anyways. So there's little for life to lose by cutting their losses, killing off their weak and unadaptable organisms early, and re-vectoring those resources to better survivors. On the surface, this seems like a cold and unsympathetic strategy. But it's not as cold and unsympathetic as the universe hovering above our heads seemingly determined to kill us. Moreover, 4 billion years worth of data suggests predation is an incontrovertibly winning strategy for survival. Hence, it's ubiquity in nature.